Welcome to But What About Me, a career success podcast dedicated to giving a voice to underrepresented populations or UPs and helping each navigate their career to reach their highest potential. This podcast is brought to you by JenniferTardy.com. Welcome to the very first episode of But What About Me? I'm your host, Jennifer Tardy. We're kicking off our first episode with Crystal Covington, and I promise you this is an episode you do not want to miss. Now, Crystal is the CEO and founder of Women of Denver. It's a social enterprise association helping professional women develop their business skills, build confidence, and earn their worth as business leaders. Launching in 2014, Women of Denver now has a community of thousands and continues to grow. This group has over 40 events per year, ranging from 15 to 150 attendees. Now, Crystal has presented a TEDx talk and has been featured in numerous media outlets such as Fox News, Forbes, Entrepreneur on Fire, and Women Taking the Lead. I enjoyed talking to Crystal about why you should target high demand, low competition jobs as a career strategy. In today's episode of But What About Me, we focus on women, particularly women of color. Crystal talked about how to develop business acumen, being first generation in corporate America, creating your own role within a company and even negotiating pay, and how working for practical companies can lead to big bucks and beware of imposter syndrome. Stay tuned to hear from Crystal. All right. Well, Crystal, welcome to the show. So we've already had an opportunity to share with our readers your bio. Is there anything else that you would like to add that you would like for them to know about you? Oh, gosh, just that I love life and I love helping other people to succeed more, more than I do myself. I think I spend more time helping other people than strategizing my own life. <laughs> so, you know, we, we brief people already on um, just some information about Women of Denver, but what do you want them to know specifically about this organization since you, co- since you founded it yourself and everything? You know, I was, I literally just came from a walk with a new friend in the neighborhood that I was sharing the story with. And, you know, I never would have thought that I would have something that would be, um, it's one of the first organizations that comes up in search. One of the first things people think of or recommend when somebody new moves to Denver. And, you know, for me, that was, one of the things that when I first moved to Denver, I was a new person in a new area and I just wanted to create something that was a community for people like me who were looking for a professional atmosphere, who wanted to, you know, connect with the type of people that, you know, are like myself, that care about their futures, that love helping and supporting other people, like to make an impact in the world. And I think it's incredible that I was able to build it and take it to the level that it's at right now. And just to be able to make something that can be a legacy and that so many people look up to and has been such an inspiration. Okay, okay, awesome, awesome. So I'm wondering, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there's probably a connection between the focus of Women in Denver and the focus of our topic today, which is low competition, high demand careers. And so I thought that that whole notion was absolutely amazing. Low competition, high demand careers. But I even said, hey, Crystal, can you talk about this in terms of women, more specifically women of color? And if we can talk about Black and Latino women as we're going throughout this whole interview. So my question to you is, is there a connection? Women of Denver, low competition, high demand careers? Women of Denver really came from me and my loneliness. (laughs) And one of the things I do teach is, you know, being very strategic about your career and your business and looking for things that actually can make you money. So there's a connection in that and that this is a new part of my philosophy and, you know, something that I'm really trying to work on helping and support other women of color to get an understanding of. Perfect. Okay. All right. So I was wrong about that, but I still love that there's a slight, a slight connection. So, okay, before we even dive into this, what do you mean when you say low competition, high demand careers? 
So this is something I just recently learned through talking to other people and then through kind of talking to my husband about our careers and what we've experienced. And um, what it really means is having a, so there are lots of jobs that you can have in the world, mm -hmm. but there are certain roles in companies um, or as a business owner, if, if you're a business owner, but you know, there are certain roles within companies that solve specific challenges that the business is dealing with that very few people can solve. And when you're able to solve for that challenge and there's very few people that can do that, they're willing to pay more to get that challenge solved. And so those high demand, low competition roles are those ones that solve very important business problems um, but there's not a lot of people that know how. And sometimes it requires a lot of education. So it might be something that, you know, you would need to have maybe some tech experience, um, some degree programs, things like that. But a lot of times it's just understanding the business world, having that strong business acumen and knowing what the challenges are and finding your way to figuring out what it takes to solve them so that you're the person that has the solution. But it doesn't necessarily always require going back to school and spending tens of thousands of dollars on a new degree. Okay. Okay. So, but what about me, right? The whole notion of this podcast, but what about me? What if I am um, a woman, Black or Latino, Mm -hmm. Why should I, in particular, care about this? You know, I was just saying before we started recording, you know, I've had conversations with people from these, you know, as Black and Latino women, we're less likely to come from these families of people who, you know, have legacies of lots of successful lawyers and doctors and, you know, people that have been in the business world and have knowledge to pass down to us. So for us, we're learning these things as we go. And I've had conversations with people where, you know, they'll talk about what they learned in their families, you know, or what they saw their dad do or something. And I get kind of jealous and I say, oh, God, you had that experience? You know, my dad was awesome. He was a factory worker. He did his thing and he was proud of it and he made good money, you know, but he couldn't tell me how to, um, succeed in the type of world that I was in you know he couldn't really when it came down to getting job advice it was kind of like well just do what your boss says you know and you know just trying to he was just trying to be encouraging but there's no um, business acumen advice that I could get um, so for us we have to figure it out on our own and stuff like this like this show is going to help you know, to shorten that learning curve because there is a learning curve and we're behind on knowledge. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, I was even remembering, I was telling someone the other day about when I first went to college. So I went to Virginia Tech and Virginia Tech is known for the engineering program. But ironically, I didn't know anything about engineers outside of people on trains, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it just goes to show, because when you're talking about our families, like that resonates with me as well, too. Um, if we don't know about certain jobs and we're not exposed to certain career paths, because my mom and dad also worked in a factory, too, it, it can really limit us as well. So, no, I, I like that. Um, so let me ask you, because uh, a lot of people would say, hey, you know, focus on new grads, this would be for you. Some people would say, well, if you're more experienced, this would be for you. But who exactly does this, who's the sweet spot? Um, at what po point in your career would this be a great tactic for you to look at? I think the best place for this to be your main tactic is when you're about mid-career. So you've had enough experience to play around in business, see what you're good at, start obtaining skills and asking those questions. So when you're new and you're young and people accept you as somebody who doesn't know and is will they're willing to tutor and mentor you, that's when you should be asking to find out what's going on in this business. So I remember I had a job. I was not accepted super well in, in this job and, and what I was doing, but I was trying to figure out how the business makes money. I remember asking different executives and board members and saying, um, can you tell me how this business makes money? Because I didn't get it. It wasn't obvious. It's not always obvious, you know. Right. Um, 
and they would say, well, why are you trying to figure this out? What do you want to, what are you trying to do? And eventually I got, I talked to enough people and tried to figure this out enough that they were able to tell me um, through bits and pieces from talking to people, I was able to figure out how this company really makes money. And then I knew where to focus my energy when I talked to the executives or when I tried to get in and do and provide solutions. So you can provide better solutions for a business which gets you higher up if you get the business. So at those younger levels, be paying attention to that stuff, asking those questions, finding out how companies make and save money, and you know, really um, trying to figure out what solutions they're missing. So look at the roles that are there and listen when they say, oh, if I just had somebody that could help with this. Oh man, if only you know, we knew how to solve that. Those are the things that you're going to start paying attention to that are going to lead you to, you know, how you start weaving your way um, to when you get mid-career and you, you have all this experience, you know how to drive that experience so that you can be that person that solves that problem. And I like that you explained it that way. So it's not necessarily that you need to go and look at a completely different industry and gain all of these new skills because you're saying that if you're already on a job, every organization, they have their, they still have their gaps where they have a need, a demand for someone. Why not look there? You already have the experience there so far. Just, and so you're basically creating your own job by looking at yes. the gaps of that company. Yes. Okay. I, I did it incidentally by, uh, uh, by accident at a job that I was at where, um, granted, I didn't know how to negotiate, so there was no raises attached to these opportunities I got. Um, but I remember the, they had, a, they couldn't hire more people, but they had a lot of work going on. And the CEO was like the only person that could do certain things. So going to the city to, it was a development company. So going to the city and asking for zoning changes or, you know, going to present a property for funding and generally it would be one of the executives but they were busy running things and making these properties get built mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot getting built at the time so he had asked my boss he says look i need somebody to go there's um a, a city council meeting tomorrow and i need somebody to go and talk about this project so we can get the zoning changed because if we don't get this done we can't build this property on time. Mm. And so she said no, because she wasn't comfortable speaking in front of people. And she says, but I think Crystal can do it. And I was like, what? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I've never done that before. So um, I said yes, because, you know, Papa said, listen to your boss. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, so I did it. And then after succeeding at it, you know, going to city council, succeeding in getting a zoning change somehow and you know then I became that person and so I kind of accidentally ended up in one of those things but you can see those things happening and take those opportunities to put yourself in the position where you can start doing new things and like for somebody in my level I was called an administrative assistant I was one step from the receptionist desk I should not have been going in place of the CEO to go speak and make stuff happen for this business so I got that opportunity because there was a missing piece. Mm, great, great, great point. And you bring me to another point too. So you had mentioned that in your example, you took this opportunity, um, the pay didn't necessarily increase, at least not then. So I, I wanna sort of connect this to all the conversations happening right now about the wage gap, women and even when you think about again black and latino women we're all the way at the end when it comes to earnings so um, one of the things that i was talking about before is that uh, we black women are number i think number six of seven when it comes to how low we are under earnings and latino women they're number they're right below us so if we're six they're seven right okay so let's connect the two um, when it comes to looking at high demand, low competition jobs and, and still thinking about how we can close the wage gap, are you a proponent of, you know, step into that role and then figure out the earnings later or, hey, this is high demand. 
uh, low competition, I should be getting paid more. W what are your thoughts around that? So by nature of not having any idea how money is negotiated at that time and being really unconfident, I naturally took the route of use it as a learning experience and sell it later. Um, okay. But I would advise people to learn how to negotiate so that when you have those opportunities, you can, because the company needed it. And at that time, if I had said, you know what, if I'm going to be going in place of the CEO, the CEO makes X, you know, and I know what the salary is because I was doing financial paperwork. So I knew what the overall company payroll is and all of that stuff. So it's like, I, I had an idea of what somebody who's doing that should have been making. If you don't, there's lots of ways to find out. But I could have very easily said, okay, I succeeded yesterday and I see that you're now assigning me to more of this. This is a very valuable thing. And right now I'm still at the pay rate I was when I was answering the phone. Mm -hmm. So I think this constitutes me being paid X. And that's what I would have advised me to do. And a lot of people get worried that if they do something like that, they're going to get fired or even at the very, at the very least, they'll be out of favor with their boss. But I've actually seen at that very company, somebody that was out of favor and he got paid a lot of money. So mm -hmm. he wasn't <laughs> losing anything financially from being out of favor. He just got treated like a jerk sometimes. <laughs> um, so if that's the worst that can happen, take your money, go buy yourself a nice house. <laughs> that's so right. You go someplace nice when you leave that jerk. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense, makes complete sense. So um, what about for the person that says, okay, I'm probably going to have to exit the company that I'm in, right? Um, it, it makes me think about um, industries in particular. Are there particular industries that, um, that job seekers should think about in terms of high demand, low competition jobs? So I, I waver on this. So there's two things to think about. So there are hot industries, that, you know, in the words of Sheryl Sandberg are like a rocket ship, you know, like tech and places like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's stuff that's just really practical. And I see people making a lot of money in these really practical businesses. Um, you know, my husband has very quickly in the last few years uh, become a C-level executive. He's a chief, you know, and he's in the settlements industry. I don't even, I'm, I'm just now learning what they do. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Right. But it's just one of those practical things that, you know, they have the money to pay well because it's just one of those sleeper industries that no one wakes up and says, I'm going to be in the settlements industry. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just these things, or I was looking at, um, I was creating a leads list for my own business and I was looking at this list of top businesses, you know, top businesses by earnings and top women in business to um, create a mailing list for. And a lot of those businesses are things I wouldn't even think are a business. I'm like, I don't even know if somebody does that, but that's a thing that's very practical that needs to be done. You know, like somebody manages, you know, uh, a cleanup after a construction project or all these just random simple things that you wouldn't even think about. You wouldn't say, you know, gosh, I really want to start a business. Let me figure out what needs to be cleaned up. <laughs> right. Don't do that. right. You know, those businesses a lot of times are doing really well and they have tactical things operationally that they need specialists in. And I've met a lot of people that make a lot of money. You know, I'm not talking about you know, fifty thousand dollars. I'm talking about one fifty, two hundred thousand dollars. People are making by being solution providers in these practical companies. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've been hearing a lot about the um, unemployment rate, and we see that it's down to. And I, I think it was July of this year. It was down to about three point nine percent. So my question to you is: In your opinion, is this a job seekers market? Or is it only a job seekers market if you're looking at, again, these high demand, low competition jobs? I think when you're in a high demand, low competition job, it's always your market. Mm -hmm. And, 
you know, I was just doing a recording for women of Denver for a online um, training. And one of the things that I had um, talked about is the fact that I've talked to a lot of people that in during the downturn. So I graduated um, right before the financial downturn of 2008. Okay. And so um, the business that I worked for at that time was actually one of those businesses that survives and actually thrives during those downturns. And there's a lot of people that do well in those downturns. So what I want to say is, um, you know, those high demand, uh, low competition jobs are the type that in a downturn, they generally are still needed and they'll probably keep their job and they'll probably still make good money because of the fact that they're so valuable. Um, I think that with the, I mean, granted, I'm in Denver as well and they call it a, a um, oh gosh, I can't think of it right now. It's like an employment war. It's a hiring war here. They have a- oh, Like a, a bidding, bidding war or something. It's like people are, um, companies are, are fighting to get good talent, mm -hmm. a talent war. That's what they're referring to it mm -hmm. as. Mm -hmm. um, and so I imagine with low unemployment, there's a, it, it probably looks like that in a lot of different places. Um, but when you're in that, you have the opportunity to really um, take on, you know, challenge and, and take on jobs that maybe pay more or get new opportunities you may not have been able to get before because they really just they need somebody in and they're willing to train whereas in those tougher financial times they want somebody that's done the job for 10 years and doesn't need a single ounce of training or um, any in, um, coaching or anything like that um, but right now they're willing to take that on so it's a good time to get in on something and start learning the ropes and getting your way weaving your way up the ranks okay okay and you just made me think about something that i um i did want to bring up too so just to hear your thoughts on it now globalization is becoming um um it's global i can't even get the word out globalization is making diversity as a center of conversation and so when we begin to think about um, how diversity impacts the bottom line we know that oftentimes as companies are becoming more global they need more um, um, insight Mm -hmm. diverse perspectives which comes from diversity in general diversity just means different they need different people at the table yeah um how does do you agree with that and how do you also see diversity adding to this whole high demand low competition perspective i think that on our end as the peop as 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 a job seeker i don't know if that's something to really um that you can really do much with but i think there's a lot of awareness these companies have mm -hmm. of um of the the value of equity for example somebody that i i actually had on the cover of my magazine cuz she's just so brilliant she's got there's a technology called pipeline equity um, her name is Katika Roy, and she built this technology, and she goes into companies and teaches them that for every, and I'm going to quote it wrong, but I think it's like, you know, for every 3%, for every 10% greater equity, you know, every time they increase the equity in their company, and she's specifically talking about gender equity for the most part, but as they increase gender equity, they also increase profit. Um, so she's able to measure that. And so I anticipate there's probably going to be others that follow Sue when they see her success and say, okay, well, there will be more technologies actually measuring this and teaching companies to value diversity because they can see measurably, oh, this makes my company make more money when I have more people that have different opinions, ideas, and backgrounds. Um, so as that changes, it's going to give us more opportunities to be accepted into those positions or be groomed into those positions. Um, one of the interviews I just recently did uh, with someone, um, a man who works for a tech company, um, I asked him, you know, what do you do to help increase gender equity in your industry? And he said to me, I'm coaching a woman because he actually was trying to solve this problem. He said, you know, everybody that works for me is a man. 
and he asked smart women around him, how do I fix this? And they said, just think about, uh, he's in the tech industry. They said, just think about how you got interested in coding. Who taught you? It was a man that mentored him and taught him to code. So they said, you need to start co coaching more women. When you become a coach for those women, you bring more women into your industry and teach them to do it. So there just may not be enough women that have been taught how to do this and are passionate about it to apply to your company. And so he actually went out and started coaching because he's aware that he needs to diversify his team and he's actually making steps to do it. And that's because of all the stuff that's out there. People have been talking about it, mm -hmm. telling each other that this is a value. So now he can take action. So I just feel like there's going to be a lot more people doing things like that in the future. I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, and in connection to talking about equity, um, Women in Denver is doing a lot with equity right now. Um, can you tell people about what your organization is doing about pay equity in general and, um, and what you're doing to help to close the, the wage gap? So my perspective on this is, well, we do our best to educate others as we can, but as women of Denver, you know, my role in this is to help women take ownership of what they can control. And it's the same with everybody listening to this. You know, you can't change the fact that there is um, prejudice out there that people will make decisions based on how you look or prefer someone based on the fact that maybe that person looks more like them or has the same background. We can't control that, but we can take ownership of understanding negotiation, understanding how to position ourselves in the right places to make sure we're getting paid our worth and that we understand tactics of how to get in on the right places, how to be charismatic, you know, how to overcome, you know, all the barriers as much as we can through our actions. And then I put money into the places where I know they're doing things like making legislative pushes and lobbying and doing things to help progress and forward things um, legally. I've read a lot of stuff that says that, you know, a lot of the changes, even with um, racism and things like that, they changed, people's sentiment changed after laws changed because they just had to adjust and adapt. And people kind of explain away their actions you know, versus saying, well, the law made me do it. Then they kind of explain internally why well, I did it because I wanted to. Mm, right. um, it's just weird psychological things that we do, but it helps. So, you know, as these legislations change, as culture changes with it, you know, I feel like there'll be, um, those things will be changing, but in our piece of it, as we wait for these things to change, as we wait for that, we prepare ourselves and arm ourselves with the business acumen that we need and confidence. Cause I, I feel like a lot of women, and I will say, you know, women of color struggle the most with confidence. I think I live every single day in imposter syndrome. Yeah. I, 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 love, that somebody put it, yeah, I love that somebody put a name to it. Uh -huh. um, but it's that feeling that you're just never doing enough, that you don't know enough, that you're not prepared enough, that everybody is better than you. And it's a sickness. Mm -hmm. um, but women struggle so much with confidence and confidence not only in our capabilities, but confidence in knowing that we can, you know, go after things that we should, you know. I was talking with um, a, a friend of mine. She has an organization called Sistapreneurs, and she helps mm -hmm. Black women become, you know, stronger, better entrepreneurs and succeed. And we were talking about our own things that we do to block ourselves, you know, times that we've blocked ourselves from getting a client by saying, oh, I... I haven't done that for, a, you know, they'll say, like, she gave an example. She said, somebody asked me to do blank thing, and I've only done it for myself. So I said to her, oh, I've only done it for me, so I'm not sure if it'll work for you. So maybe you find somebody that's done it for other people before. If it were a man, he would have said, oh, sure, I've done it before. I can do it. <laughs> he would have just taken the role, and I've done the same and said, you know what? Um, I told a guy, he, he was desperate to pay me. And I knew, it was like, he just wanted to pay me. And I said, you know, but I don't, I've never done that. He wanted me to do things like get him a, um, 
you know, get him a TED talk, get him, you know, featured in this and that or whatever. And I'm like, well, you've done all that. You've done that. <laughs> but, but I've done it for me. I, I had a TED talk. I didn't know if I could help somebody else. You know, two months later, I ended up helping someone get a TED talk successfully. So I was like, oh, dang it. I could have done that. <laughs> you know, but I told him, I said, well, I would, you would be paying me to try. And he said, but I want to pay you to try. And I couldn't understand it. It was the craziest moment. Mm -hmm. But people will pay you to try because they trust your effort. And that, that was just crazy. I had no confidence in myself. So, so someone was telling me, someone introduced me to this whole notion the other day about white boy confidence and how, and how there's this, there's this confidence. And so even when you think about, we were talking about um, Sheryl Sandberg um, earlier and how even in her book, it talks about how, Women wait until they meet all of the qualifications for a role before they ever apply. Men um, say, okay, I meet most of them and I'll figure the rest out. And so um, what this speaker was talking to me about before was, we all need to find that, that inner white boy confidence where it's okay to stand in front of a group and say, I know what I know and I'm gonna figure everything else out, right? Because you'd be surprised at how much you actually know. <laughs> grow um, from just taking a leap sometimes and so I like that term and it's such a compliment so okay um, let me ask you okay we're, we're talking about women of Denver do you have any upcoming events through them or any of your own speaking events coming up um, I don't know what timing this will publish so I don't know if it'll be passed we have a quarterly networking event every quarter so there's always there's always something going on at women of Denver and we even have people that aren't in Denver join Women of Denver. Um, but we have uh, a new digital network that I just launched that we're putting in online courses and things like that. So lots of different ways that people can engage and learn. Um, so we're just expanding so that we can have lots more opportunities. And um, outside of that, I'm doing for the Women's Foundation of Colorado, I'll be um, the luncheon host for their upcoming event. This, it'll probably be published before that. So that's October 25th. There's still tickets available. Good. I'll be, <laughs> uh, I'll be, I'll be there. And, and then, um, yeah, if anybody wants to come to South Dakota, I have a speaking engagement there as well. <laughs> I wonder what the temperature is like this time of the year out there. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, but you mentioned something, and I don't want to let it go because – you said that you're, you're opening or you're thinking of opening um, membership to people who live outside of Denver? So we already had uh, members from other states that were joining us um, and we're opening up. So our, we have a digital platform and we're about to open it up uh, soon. Um, okay. once okay. my marketing team gets every, I mean, it's, it's available now. Anybody can come in, but it says women of Denver right now. It will eventually say something else. And, you know, because I have people even in other countries that have been following and they follow what I teach, they follow even the events and they always are messaging me or texting me and saying, oh, I wish I could come to this event. It looks so great. You know, they want to be part of it where they see the pictures from our events and they're like, oh my gosh, these people look great. I want to meet them. Um, and so we're, you know, creating ways, you know, just re creating a brand so that they feel comfortable joining into it um, and being a part of what we're creating. Awesome. So if people are interested, how and where can they find you? Um, they can go to thewomenofdenver.com and they can join the online only membership, which gives them the chance to be a part of that digital network. And we have online events where we have meetings like this, where we can just kind of talk about different topics. We'll call them office hours. And there's online trainings and a great community of people. And the tool even lets you find people near you. So um, once there's more people from different areas, you'll be able to connect and say, hey, we're both in San Francisco, you know, let's meet up for coffee. So it's just a really great place to um, meet high achieving women, you know, and high achieving men women are basically just people who are on their grind, that want to be successful, and that are wanting to make an impact in the world too. So you want to make an impact, you're not just there to, you know, you know, elbow your way to success. <laughs> right. You want to do it taking others with you and helping to make the world a better place. 
Awesome. So I'm one of those stalkers too. So I'm, I'm really excited to know that there's an online only option. <laughs> great, great, great. So, okay. So before we wrap this up, I like to do like this, this rapid fire of questions, only three questions. And I want to know the first thing that comes to mind. You ready? Okay. It's never too late to go for a walk. Okay. Um, I get inspired by ice cream, <laughs> coconut milk oh, okay. ice cream. What, what kind of ice cream? Coconut milk. I've never tried that. I'm going to have to try that. Okay. Career success means money. I love that. That was a great way to wrap up the show. Okay. So it was a pleasure having you on the show. The details that you mentioned earlier about Women of Denver, we're going to put in our details section to make sure that everyone can find it. And so thank you for being a part of But What About Me? We appreciate you, Crystal. Thank you. I'll see you soon. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Be sure to tune in next week because we have so much more in store for you. Until next time, keep going, keep growing, and keep glowing.